guy. Would you want to make a film about Burma? He was violent, aggressive, a liar and a thief. And in case you're wondering, I left him. That's how one of his exes responded when she refused to be interviewed. I don't remember him being a liar and a thief. Aggressive maybe, but entertaining with it. A strange mix of social and antisocial. The enigma that was Boomer. He was not quite the man, but pretty close to it. He disappeared from our loose-knit community of wild hippies at the end of the 1980s. He wasn't the sort of guy to come around and say goodbye. Gone, but not forgotten. He had charisma and presence, and he was different than the rest of us, wasn't he? But I think he played on it, really. In retrospect, if you look back, he played on it. I was most impressed with him when he was pretty well intoxicated and was more or less the puppeteer of the whole pub. He was the ringmaster. He was the lightning conductor. And everybody was sort of attentive to him. He was, I don't know, some powerful energies. That w was the thing about Boomer, this instant fun. Get as much fun out of life as you can, squeeze it. It's like Boomer could do whatever he wants, that's all right. Boomer's law. You know, Crocodile Dundee, he was actually sort of a bit of an equivalent in a West Coast way. <laughs> Not crocodiles, but I don't know, possums and, um, yeah, eels. <laughs> and although he could be very abrasive and hard to deal with and was quite opinionated, but the thing about him, he could always walk the talk. Boomer connected with a lot of people back then. We'd all come to the remote west of Golden Bay to find or escape from something. Some stay. This isn't just Boomer's story, it's theirs as well. I came here on, on holiday when I was a kid and I went out to this area and just absolutely loved the scenery. You know, I was only about nine and I thought, what an amazing place, because it is beautiful, it is beautiful. And so when the opportunity came to buy some land, when this woman wanted $12,000 to go to this big festival in Oregon, and this was in 1979, and we had $12,000. So that's how come we got 210 acres. What's that guy with all the Rolls Royces? Rajni, she just wanted to buy Raj, failed him, fund him into another bloody Rolls Royce, didn't she? And we were really, really naive. We'd all moved to Golden Bay, everyone that at that time was an incomer, an outsider. We were back to the landers. So we were building, we were feuding with the building inspector. Our prime motivation was to do things as simply as possible on a piece of land that belonged to you. And we were forging new relationships with like-minded people. And everybody was trying to earn a modicum of money to keep going, either through cottage craft industry and or with the uh, dope growing back up. I was a possum trapper and Bill was a gold miner. We bought this bus and we travelled with the bus right round the South Island and we came to Golden Bay. And I had a little possum camp at Shakespeare Flat right on the river's edge. I had to daily cross the river to do the traps on the other side. You had to be very careful with the weather because you have to do your traps every day. And as the river comes up, you can't get across. So you have to spring them before the weather gets bad. There was that sense of people looking for something more than they'd had in their life, or different. I sent them packing. <laughs> There's this photos in the album there that you could view. My generation was aware of the whole sort of nuclear bomb stuff and the sense quite strongly back in the 70s, you know, with wars and things, that things could come to an end. 
and that we needed to somehow prepare for the world as we knew it falling to bits and you know set ourselves up in such a way as we were able to be self-sufficient and da 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 which seems sort of quite naive now. There was a book that used to float around called The Woodcutter's Bible or something and it was these amazing American handmade houses and most people I knew wanted to build something like that and they were stymied by regulations. The building inspector. After another ten years had by, gone by, by that time Bill was, we, we, were, we were a lot older. And, uh, and I said to Bill, well, sometime you've got to stay somewhere sometime. And I thought, well, if I had to live anywhere permanently, there's one place I rule out. I, I loved South Western. That was number one for me in New Zealand. But I had ruled out any country that was sandfly country. I wasn't ever going to be an old woman in sandfly country. That's, that's not, no, I, I, I wasn't. And, and, and so it's a good climate. I said to Bill, think of the old bones if you get a bit older now. You've got to be sometime somewhere. Yeah, that's how it happened. The weather, the old bones. Since the age of five, I've been continually coming and going from Golden Bay. Yeah. So there's a contrast between uh, city and rural living. We were left to our own devices throughout the summer holidays and just to fill in our own time as we pleased, which was completely free for kids. And, and contrasting to how we lived in the city through the school term, to come down here and run around like wild boys was, was awesome. When I look back, I definitely had a happy childhood, but you don't really realise that till you get older and you think about what might have happened. It was, at the time, it's just a childhood. It's the same as everybody else's. Um, we were living up a valley full of uh, dairy farmers and their children, and we lived on a farm, even though we didn't work on the farm. We felt the same as everybody else, and everyone had a very similar upbringing. People aren't very ostentatious. Everyone's got a pretty basic house. They might have a huge wad of land, and maybe when you're older you realise how valuable that would be, but when you're a kid, you know, every, everyone's pretty much the same, except maybe some of the children whose parents were more alternative. Maybe they didn't have a television, or they ate, um, you know, different types of food and, and things like that. So I think um, the Golden Bay that I grew up on was quite conservative and mainstream compared to some of the more alternative lifestyles that, that were around as well. My ex-husband, Len, he bought this bulldozer and then we put this road in and there was a power board road because MED had power poles all over this place and we just followed that road with his stupid little bulldozer with the fucking wind-up blade. I mean, it was ludicrous, really, because if we'd have just got someone to do a proper job, but my ex, he insisted on doing everything himself. I was like 22 and I had this place and he was like going on to 30 and I thought he knew what he was doing, but he actually didn't. And I think I spent so much energy, you know, wasted energy, but we all did really, didn't we? You know, if we look about how inefficient our lifestyles were, I don't know why we did that. I think it was because we were all over-educated, underachievers, <laughs> but basically we still needed to do something really, didn't we? And we all came here and had ideals and dreams and waiting for the revolution and it never bloody came. I just had this theory that they saw feminism coming and they thought if they didn't get these women out somewhere in the sticks, <laughs> they, they weren't going to have them under control, so they dragged them out into the middle of nowhere and got them pregnant, barefoot and pregnant, and washing nappies in the creek, you know. It was <laughs> I wanted washing machines. I always felt like I was a traitor to the cause, having an automatic washing machine. But Len, he was quite into tech stuff, you know, he really liked all that tech stuff. And he was always going to, never did any housework, he said he was going to build me a robot, and after 14 years, no fucking robots. So <laughs> Len was just part of that over-mothered, under-achieving generation, really. Well that came out and lived here. I was not the average woman. Like even in the hills, uh, I was there for the same reasons as them. But in, in those years, there was no other woman possum trapper around. There were, women were helping their men folk with the possums and taking out, but they weren't doing the whole job. Bimo was very chauvinistic and I, I was given an, an odd dig and not so nice. And I used to just, 
When men, if men want to be like that, I mean, oh, that's not bloody. Egg, no. I did that for 40 years in the bush. Egg, no. I'm not having an argument. I, I lose anyway. I'm always the weaker part. A wipe, well, um, fight with different weapons, that was always mine. Bill, my husband, was never a possum trapper, but he was a gold miner. And Boomer was about one of the first people in the bay that we met. And that is just the very reason, the same interest, the same kind of bush people, you could say. I remember visiting them, and the two guys most contentedly pottering in the creek, you know, there was no argument, but every now and then one will say something, and oh, you hear them roaring with laughter, and they couldn't work for a while. Uh, how, why do people get off on each other? They sense a great sense of fun. I met him in the local pub. He had been a, a biker in Western Australia and um, had sort of gone against the wind, which is his favourite song. But he turned out to be a very affable, generous spirited sort of a character and I thought, oh OK, I can get to like this guy. And um, I knew that he was interested in gold diving and that's what I was doing at the time. And so we hired him as the third person in the team. and. Uh, he just loved getting into real gold, you know, because he'd just been mucking around on the edges. By the time he came in with me, I learned a hell of a lot, and we learned a lot together. And then when I sold him my dredge, he went into the same routines. <laughs> a self-employed silver culture sawmill and contractor. Having done a couple of years working for a mining company up in the mountains up here and actually flowing over all these lucky buggers that were busy dredging down there in that river and thinking, oh, I'm getting down in there too. What happened was there was a bit of a gold rush on the place. At one time there was probably at least a dozen dredges working up the slate, of which Boomer was one of them. For a while, apparently, while we were back in the Territory, he was making a heap of money. Like, you know, a couple of thousand bucks a week for a while. But then he left, he left, he just walked out of the river and people said, oh, there's still gold there. And other people went back in and got another mm. uh, 70 ounces out from where Boomer had been. But he just walked away from it. So, oh, no, I've had enough for a while, go and do something else, you know. But if he'd stuck at it, he could have been filthy rich, you know, because the gold was there and it was only that far under the surface. In the heyday, it was like $800 an ounce, early 80s. Good money and good pickings in the river. You know, you, you could dredge those textbook spots and they'd pay. I remember 47 ounces, you know, over about six days. Y you know, like stuff like this, you know, we had handfuls of it. You know, you rattle in your hand like lead-headed nails, it was incredible. That come out of the rocky, and I lifted this flat rock over and here's this death's head. <laughs> Put a shiver down my bloody spine and I got out of there. See that ring? Boomer, Boomer mined that gold out of the Slate River, and we took it to Peter Mears and he turned it into a ring and it gave it to me, it was very romantic. He had one, but he chucked his away. <laughs> Things were like that back then. <laughs> Basically, he just worked. Get up in the morning, have a feed, put his gear on and go and work. Come home mid-afternoon, throw everything off, cook a feed, grumble and moan, cut some firewood, do the dishes, sleep. You know, and a mighty fine bushman, and a good camp cook, quite assertive in his camp rules, you know. The coffee had to be made right. <laughs> And if you made him a cup of tea in the morning around the campfire and he was a bit pissed off or grumpy and you put it down in front of him and it wasn't looking exactly right, you just kick it over and, uh, and just hang, hang a glum look, you know. So what the fuck do you do that for, Boomer? You can make your own next. And, oh, in the end I gave up making Billy tea for the blighter because he is too picky. One tea leaf floating on the top. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely great big setup, Boomer's camp. All under tarp. With a chainsaw made banquet table anybody would be proud of, you know. You know, it's quite a substantial covered in area with this lovely fireplace, you know, a nice woodshed and this lovely grassy little clearing well established. 
this was a, a gold miner's birthday party in uh, 1987 and most of the men here uh, involved in underwater dredging. Quite a party that night. The river was raging and in flood just five metres away from here and uh, Neil had had so much to drink that we were worried that if he let go of that tree he might disappear out to sea. But uh, <laughs> anyway, that was the only time that alcohol was ever seen on the gold fields while we were involved. He used to spend a lot of time up the river on his own and then of course he'd come out to town and he'd let loose, you know, and he'd like to make noise at the pub as people do, you know, uh, but then he'd turn tail and he'd skate back up into the scrub and maybe get over his post-party blues and start feeling a bit better about himself because he upset someone. And I remember one time when we were partying, I think it might have been the first time I met Boomer, and someone was really proud of a bud. And it was a nice bud, you know, six inch long bud, nice and tacky. And they pulled it out of their pocket and they slapped it on the table, well come on smoke this. And Boomer reached into his shirt and he says, that ain't a bud, this is a bud. And it was that bloody log. <laughs> so, oh, I think that's when I first met Boomer. In those years we all drank an awful lot. And they all could drink an awful lot. Oh, that bonds males a little bit, doesn't it? And they can drink together. Yeah, we had some pretty good um, party times, you know, we no kids and you know, every second or third night actually in those days. We would party. I mean we used to go to these dances and we used to wear overalls and I'm thinking, what were we thinking? Well we were just young. We were just young and spunky and we could get away with wearing overalls. I mean it was kind of crazy really. And everyone out there and boomer and everybody and oh my socially retarded husband glowering at me from the sidelines. <laughs> you know, I was out there having a wonderful time dancing. Boomer's friend um, Bill Crump, his son came along with a carton of um, gold top mushrooms and put them on the table in the bar and um, quite a few people were helping themselves including a couple of 70 year olds. We used to grow cannabis in the hills here and one year we lost our crop because Boomer's brother Dennis set up a tree and watched where I went <laughs> and flogged it all, bastard. He, he wasn't a great guy, was he? Well, you know, but that was just how it was really there, the Wild West, wasn't it? There was sort of, it was a funny thing, it was quite loose and well, but there was a very strong work ethic all the same, you know, there was that sense of um, really achieving things, getting things done, you know. You didn't just sit about and at the end of the day when you'd achieved things, then you could party. <laughs> With as much energy put into that as doing the work. Yeah. Good, I've got lovely chocks. Really nice. Aren't you? You're nice chock and you don't get in my garden because I've fenced it off. You see, one day she'll get old and I'll have to kill you, you know, it's kind of a hard thought really. Living here toughened me up, you know, I think I had to learn to do things. Like all the possum trapping I did, you know, once I couldn't kill a possum. I remember once that I had this mama in a trap and had a baby. And it was quite a big baby. And I had to shoot the baby and shoot the mum. And I, was, and I knew the mum was really upset that I'd shot the baby. And that was really traumatic to me. <clears throat> so from now on I'd always shoot the mother first so it didn't see me kill her baby. But now I can kill my rabbits after they've been eating the garden. You know, they're no longer decorative features in the landscape. They're little freezer roasts. You know, that's how I'm looking at them now. Little rabbits. You see, basically the reason they're here is because a lawn is an environmental crime, right? And I just thought I needed something to mow it. It's a constant war, I think. I've wiped out all the possums here to make my life easier and I've bloody introduced a plague of rabbits. <laughs> what was I bloody thinking? Oh, I've got this early memory, um, probably one of my earliest memories, and it's of Boomer. And it would be one of my only memories of Boomer as well. Was visiting him in Rockville with my mother and getting attacked by this rooster. And, you know, it got me there and there and still scarred. But uh, Boomer went and got a gun and shot it 
right then and there and uh, it's just a powerful image for me looking back on it now uh, the image of the rooster and what the rooster symbolizes and the age I was three years old uh, the situation in my life which was that my parents were splitting up boom was very much implicated in that so I was taken away from this context here at exactly that time of the rooster incident so the context of the rooster memory yeah. it's symbolic of of divorce yeah and separation yeah. what I knew growing up was that the man that I called dad Merv wasn't my biological father I knew that I knew that there must have been some other guy somewhere and I think I knew his name was Boomer. Through my friend's parents I heard about the circles maybe that um, mum was part of and how she met Boomer. And I know that she rode around Australia on um, motorbikes and had great adventures and things like that but I also heard that she was one of the more sensible maybe or conservative of the bunch. And then mum met who I call dad which is Merv and she moved, must have been two or three kilometres up the road, you know, and lived in his family house there, and that's where I grew up. Always, I only have memories of that house with um, Merv and Mum and my little sister Adele. But I'd just come out of the Collingwood store and there was this guy coming towards me, and I was a wee bit scared of him, you know, he looked quite menacing in a way, fair bristling with testosterone and male threat. He had a hat on, and there was a sort of a low slung gunslinger look about him. And his boots, cowboy boots, they could have been striking sparks almost off the footpath. It was that kind of a look, that kind of a style. Um, but the thing I noticed most about him as he moved towards me, he sort of walked with a slightly bow-legged kind of way, as if he was carrying an immense amount of luggage. And it looked like it was hard work and the things a man had to bear in this life. In the end, he, he walked on past, but he seemed like he was really pissed off. He, he seemed like in a really bad mood. And um, oh, so really, I found my heart beating as we went on. He was having an off with my wife, Jane. And I wasn't exactly to pure myself, and so there was some sort of mutual understanding between us that we were both having it off with the woman we wanted to. There's a possibility that my wife ran off with Boomer because I wasn't attentive to her as I should have been. I wouldn't like to say, but anyway, in a situation that, you know, one jagger could have murdered the other one, we got on as good mates. But then everyone was screwing everyone's wife, so why should we, <laughs> you know, why should we hold him up? <laughs> why should we criticise him? Because it was, you know. Most of these women would have had husbands who were very reconstructed men, you know, back in those days. They would have been into the nappies and looking after the kids and trying to work on their jealousy issues. And they lack that sort of distance and otherness and unknowableness. They become too much like your brother. Boomer came across as this sort of archetypical, macho, unreconstructed creature, mythical kind of creature. Slightly sort of cowboy outsider, you know, all that sort of thing that us hippies were thrilled by. Um, he was sort of unknowable in the end. He was a bit of a predator. He's playing on, on all these bored, middle-class women that have been dragged into the country by their dope-smoking, neglectful husbands. He was a good friend, the sort of friend that you would go to, and so in this instance, I did. Coming back from Nelson, couldn't get home. The, the river was up. I think it was flooding up before Pakawa there. So I turned back and I thought, ah, I'll, I'll, I'll go and hang out with Boomer. The flooding's bound to go down very shortly. Uh, Boomer was living in that field up towards Rockville with a bunch of chooks. So I went up there and parked up and was nice to see him, sat down, ended up going to bed with him. 
there was no feeling of um, oh, what are we going to do about this? Um, should we talk about it? It was just never talked about again. Eventually, I must have gone in the car, flooded, flooded, gone down, and I went home. And I, uh, uh. These two young women were um, a couple of Boomer's numerous lovers, and they decided, having seen this T-shirt, the fuck all T-shirt, that um, they would do the obvious, and with enough spirits in them, they turned up both at the same time to a party and uh, blew everyone out with a fuck Burma t-shirt. That summarises Burma, I think, because that's what he said about a lot of things. I did get the feeling with um, Burma that whatever had happened to him in his life um, made it pretty hard for him to connect at any real deep level with people. He would only let people come so close and then there'd be a joke or a curse or a drink or a smoke. He didn't like to show compassion or any of those soft sort of um, attitudes to people. I actually didn't find him that interesting. I was interested in knowing him because all the people around him who were his friends I thought were really interesting <laughs> and so he was part of the group and I was interested in the effect that he had on all the women around. It was so clear that Boomer was not going to be put into a suburban house and tidied up and pushed into a routine and made to be Mr Normal, that there was no danger of his insisting that his current girlfriend um, put on a wedding ring and, you know, commit to him forever. Mum's recently told me about a time we went to a party or something to drop something off or pick something up and Boomer was there. It must have been very small and someone there mentioned that um, that was my dad or something and apparently I, I freaked out quite a lot because maybe I wasn't aware of that then. I thought, you know, it was just scary because it would have rocked your world really when you used to your mum and your dad. Boomer never brought up little kids. That's a thing he had in common with the cramps. Not being good with our own children at all. Just no connection. Wonderful with other people's children. I, mean, I think it's a bit like weekend dads, you know, they can have the fun and have kids really looking up to them and feeling, feeling like mentors almost, I suppose, without necessarily having to have the day-to-day -day responsibility. He'd do anything for anybody. You know, the old people around the place loved Boomer because he would do exactly that, you know, chop them up firewood or do voluntary work to make them happy. Mm. And they doted on him. Old people, Boomer used to venerate them. They knew everything. Even Boomer himself couldn't hold a candle up to them. He listened to the words as they were preaching the gospel. When Boomer was in prison, he wrote me a letter and it was a, a nice letter. It was very sort of brotherly and it was basically to the tune of, I was going through a bit of a hard time at that stage, but it was basically to the tune of, um, keep your chin up girl and don't let the bastards grind you down. And it, it was actually quite comforting. He broke his arm, remember, falling over in the gorge. This is after he'd been in jail. And then um, the spring after that, and uh, I noticed after that time he started to become a little, little bit more bitter in his relationships with people, you know. Mm. He'd run out of space, you know. Mm. People knew who he was and uh, the charm had gone, you know, it wasn't good enough anymore. Because mm. he had become sort of um, unreliable and a bit bitter as he got older. Yeah, towards the end, and he used to come and visit my partner, Dick, and... Um, there was a, a real sadness about him, I felt, that things hadn't worked out and, and those sort of glory days were over, you know, and people had moved on and, and maybe it was time for him to move on. Sometimes he would say to Dick, uh, I've, got to change my, I've got to change my style, this isn't working for me anymore. The girls ran away from him in the end, or he you know, lost touch with them. And and then his male friends started to do the same thing. There was a lot of suspicion and paranoia. There was heaps of pot getting grown and smoked and, you know, there was talk of narcs and Ds and, you know, just that, all that going on, you know. It's, um, 
all relatively healthy, I suppose, but if you looked at it in a context from the police and the judiciary system, they'd bloody hate it. That was sort of the end of an era because as more people came in who were involved in things that weren't just fun, smoking pot and that sort of thing, things got nasty. And a lot of people think Boomer was a bit of a rat bag, and, um, but, but I do remember when his brother got into that bit of trouble on the bridge there, you know? They threw that guy over the bridge. Well, it was Boomer that pulled his brother up and says, you know, no, I ain't going to give you no hand to shift, no bloody bodies. You're going to wait right here and the policeman's coming to see you. There were mm. big court cases and mm. um, threats of violence and guns and, and the, the halcyon days just sort of started to evaporate. Mm. And uh, the mm. place was getting too, was too small for so many nasty people in <laughs> one place. Mm. Yeah. As people got older and as their kids got older, somehow their lives got more structured. And I guess at that stage people were developing businesses or growing things, more established in whatever they'd set up to do. I had to grow up because um, I, I eventually wanted to set a reasonable example for the daughter that I had at that time. So, um, no more um, freewheeling sex um, <laughs> uh, grew out of that too. In the times of Boomer's heyday, we were all a bit wild, you know, I mean, he was the king, wasn't he? He was the party king and he'd be as wild as, wilder than anybody. And it gave us licence in a way. We, we got into a whole wild thing ourselves and there's been casualties of that. Some of our kids have been, you know, affected by that. And, it was damage and uh, you know because I work in in that realm of um, you know therapy I suppose um, I do occasionally see people whose early years um, and particularly perhaps access to drugs or um, perhaps being um, witness to adult conflict um, it probably did impact on them. But on the whole, I think they feel pretty good about having grown up in that era. I do enjoy time alone in the wilderness. I'm driven to be by myself often. I definitely want to have a detox from society. The idea is that you actually go away to expand on what reality is. And then you can bring that back with you, so you're coming back stronger. As opposed to an escape, escape of reality. Yeah, you're trying to further it. I do have a fondness for that time and a nostalgia and, you know, the way we would all get together and let our hair down and, Boomer was very much a, a part of that, and that's, that's my youth. I'd quite like to reconnect with that. I reckon, you know, in retrospect, you, you wonder if he was just a sophisticated game player. You wonder if we were just a little dalliance, just a little time here. And then he buggered off and he went somewhere else to another community and he can have another little social dalliance. Near the elusive Boomer. But I'd heard that he was a cook on a fishing boat in Hobart. Yeah, I tried to track him down. <laughs> I would have enjoyed running into him, you know, and having a laugh and a, a few beers. And... I would love Boomer to come back. I would love him to come up and have a cup of tea and talk to him and see how he is now and what's happened to him, what's he's, what he's done. And Yeah. If you want to disappear, well, you can't really do it here, can you? I mean, unless you go somewhere really cold and wet... <laughs> You know, if you go to Australia, you can go somewhere, disappear in somewhere warm and dry in a nice climate. But I love Australia. I love the outback. I love the fact that it's a red and orange place. I'd like to go and live there sometimes. This is blue and green. It's beautiful, but it's a desert in Australia. It's red and orange and there's lizards and snakes and ants and great big flying things and beautiful birds. You know, I love all the wildlife. It's fantastic, you know, and I can see why you'd want to go there. It turned out Boomer had jumped the Tasman. I met someone at a party who had his number, said he was living in Western Australia. Boomer agreed to meet. We 
landed in Perth on Australia Day and drove into the wheat belt country, east to the crossroads where Boom was based. You don't like my hippie. You haven't got a punch him. No, 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 no just don't. We were collecting ourselves, people. We were just kind of focusing. Um, <laughs> you know. I'll give you a fucking arm, you vegetarian <laughs> piece of shit. Right, we, were, uh, getting, we were just fucking off for home. I well, said, I thought oh, you'd get sick of waiting. Yeah, I know you thought you would. Yeah. No, no. I thought about ringing and then I thought, oh, no, that, that's pretty uncool. Um, we'll just turn up. But that's have... magic, isn't it? That you know, we just happen to pass on the road like that. You're looking all right, Boomer. Of course, eh? I'm looking all right. I'm really I haven't been cleaned eh? up or anything, but no. I'll do that tomorrow. No. Um, how much gear you got? We've got a bit of food and... You don't uh, need got, to use this car because it's fucking rental, so you can... I just live over there. Yeah, I know. We we'll just, well, I just sort, of, just sort of just sort of checking that we, you know, kind of had the... Well, we'll park it at home, is that put everything in the back of there. Yeah. And we've got Bronny's car up there as well, because I've got some yabby nets in down there for you to have yabbies for tea. <laughs> Sounds good to me. I like a bit yeah. of crayfish out yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. No, that'd be shit. All right. That'd be, that'd be and good. then we can drink some piss. Yeah, well, we've got a few cold ones there, but not a lot. I what you, what are you drinking? Well, that was the question. We asked oh. at the bloody Wild Catch and what's Boomer drinking? You don't go to the fucking Wild Catch and they wouldn't know me from a bar of soap. Ah, uh, Goofy did. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but we, Ronnie! We didn't embarrass you, mate. We didn't, well, I hope we didn't embarrass you. Hey, you wouldn't believe it. We stopped the fucking Wild Catch and we ran into Goofy. Now, this is my camp when I'm not uh, up in a scrub. I'm not here that often. But when I am, I, uh, yeah. Try to do a bit. I mean, there never used to be any lawn or anything here. It was just piles of shit, and all these trees actually planted these tag trees, which they're, they're bloody good for this sort of stuff. Some of the leaves are taking a flogging, but they'll come back. But oh, that got cooked. I'm not happy. Sorry, tree. It's like everything around here. If you're not hard enough, you don't fucking live. There's Bronwyn. Yippee, look at me play with your nipples, Shannon, there. Bored and run him over. I'm off to Darren. We soon met Bronnie, his partner of the last few years. She and her daughters lived in a brick farmhouse a few kilometres away. Let's get the mop and we're going. I'll get him an ice cream each. Boomer had things pretty well set up. There's a little goldfish in here. There's a little goldfish everywhere. It's silly, I know, I go and live out in the bloody desert and I come home rare goldfish. But most of this here is either native or uh, semi-desert stuff. Um, one year I decided to put a whole heap of flowers in there and what happened? They all turned out white fucking pansies. Well, I caught some shit over that, I think. Yeah, this is some of the different rock strata and, and Seams of bloody mineral you get up there. It's always going to uh, cut that and polish it. And this here just gives another example of the terrific heat that this country had in the old days. I mean, it's just literally boiled. It's like a bloody porridge of different ore bodies. And yet, as I say, there's, there's pretty exciting stuff out there. Can't get this thing going, mate. You're in for an awful long, thirsty walk. Now you've got to have them. And especially these old girls because they're, um, they're quite high off the ground. And they do a good job. These tyres are all 10 ply steel. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's that comfortable, but there's all the room in the world. It's, uh, it's very comfortable. Yeah, okay. Thanks for that, bro. Bye bye. This ground here used to just be sand. So we decided to get onto the Shire and they came to the party quite well. I think they gave us 2,000 trees. So I got all the little kids in the local community. I thought, well, that's, why not get them involved? So we come out here and over two or three days, we just, I dug the holes, they whacked the trees in. So yeah, it's, um, it's gonna be quite good because what we'll do, once the stuff gets a bit bigger and a bit more established, We'll put some uh, shorter stuff that just grows to a metre or so high and it'll be all lovely. You might get a few lizards and native animals and things come back. You can only try, can't you? No, that'll be enough of that.
I've probably been here 15 odd years now, but I've noticed the bush is not regenerating. Underneath the understory itself, there's no regrowth, no little seeds or trees or anything coming through. It just less rainfall. Well, then you'll get a huge bloody deluge comes down. You get 60 or 70 mil in three or four days, and it can't soak in fast enough because the ground's got that hard, and it just runs off and ends up in the ocean. And because these guys have come up here and they've worked their butts off, chopped down trees and cleared everything, they didn't know that you know, the rainfall was going to diminish or the salt was going to come through. What the salt's done around here just in the last three years is amazing. Long trousers. Ah. Yeah, you can't walk around out there. The scrub is just too sharp. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God damn. She needed a more bear. Is that, is that the extra good whole food? Yeah, kidney. Okay. Yeah, kidneys are good. Yeah. So we just grab a few of these little mothers. So what you were getting was just a tasteless mush. I see, break, break it open like that. Yeah, you go, I go like that and then I go. It's a bit like prawns, eh? Same. Yeah, same thing. See, that's a good bit of meat, isn't it? That's, mm. that's why I always wanted to be a butcher. So I can meet people. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can really give them a leg of mutton around the head, you know, place them meat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, stop fucking eating me feet. Chee, 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 chee. <laughs> Boomer and Bronnie had set up their own private bar out the back. A cool little retreat from all the flies, dusty roads and heat. It was 40 degrees outside. What a clown, I can't believe he did that. I'm the lucky one tonight, don't you worry. You speak for your fucking self, I'm the, Well, I am really, because I'm lucky I'm in another country to where he is. <laughs> the cane fire bar was a different zone. Boomer on his throne, holding forth. The old mixture of gems and abuse. Um, yeah, we're on a few tracks. Punched that one path through your place. Well, we did the first bit. You did fuck all of it. <laughs> He's a bobtail lizard or a shelf-backed lizard, or a sleepy lizard. But they've got that blue tongue, see? And if the little bastards grab you, they just hang on. They piss you off. But he's only small. this tree grow for the last 14, 15 years. And it's changing all the time and doing different things. You actually wouldn't think this was natural, the way it twists and forms. This is a confessional tree, as you can see. It's, it's, it, it's so there's a lot of tortured souls been here over the years confessing. And the thing's just copping all this pain. It's terrible. I don't know when it'll end. I quite like it either. Over the years, uh, as I've noticed, this is starting to cover it up a bit as I drive up. And sometimes I've been tempted to cut that limb off so I can appreciate it more. But, um, well, no, it's part of the tree, so, you know, it's, uh, I've just got to put up with it. It doesn't have to put up with me. Come on, get down here. Westport might be bloody heaven on earth, but it's a pleasant enough place. You know, I had a few uncles that worked in the mines up in Deniston. 
pretty big adventure for a kid. Give you a carbide lamp and away they go, because they were contract miners. And yeah, you just waddled around and, and, and dreamt of giant rats stealing your lunch and things. There's some big rats down there. But yeah, it was a pretty interesting time to grow up. I mean, you could go anywhere. You could get on your push bike and, you know, in, in them days your mother didn't worry if you were, it was 10 past five and you weren't home for tea or something. Oh, no, you didn't give my mum any shit. She could always outrun me till I was about 14. Yeah, good hockey player. <laughs> You got the living shit sucked out if you'd done something you went. You didn't get a clip around the ears, you got to flog them. With the nearest thing that was at there, and the first adult that grabbed you. I mean, I went to boarding school. It was a bit dramatic getting ripped up out of Westport. People running around in black demanding you do things when they want you to do them, which was either immediately or before. I just had a guts full of it, and I thought, well, I'm, I'm not putting up with this. So I got on the train to go back to school and I um, didn't go to school. I mean, I think it might have been Lone Del Getty or one of them outfits. And I went in there and saw and see if there's any jobs on farms in the high country and there was, so that was me. Yeah, a lot of the old guys who worked with were, were the old school fellows. Still bloody rounded up stock on horses. I was only a kid and I suppose the youngest guy to me would have been in his 40s. Some of those old characters were lovely, like old Eric Andrews, we used to go and, and uh, drive the sheep in there and he used to amaze me, you know, all day he'd be sitting on a horse riding along and he'd have a little five foot stock whip and he'd be cracking it top and bottom, crack, crack, you know, just things that he did that you think, shit, I wish you could do that. Or he'd crack a whip next year, he'd be playing around with the night time and he'd crack a whip next year and wrap it around you and there wouldn't be a mark on you. He'd say, come here you. Oh, they were funny buggers. And when they drank piss, oh, sometimes it was terrible because there was no glasses. They'd grab a bottle of whiskey, and I can remember on one occasion, all that was around was um, half pint milk bottles, the cream bottles, and they just m m poured this whole bottle out and sat there drinking this stuff straight. I thought, oh, God, right. Boy, are these guys men? Their eyebrows aren't even lifting. And he smoked this fucking pocket edition of Havelock Dark Tobacco. I remember I pinched some once, because he wouldn't let me smoke. And I went down there and I did the old thing, and it was all in flakes. And I lit it up, oh shit, it was like, it was like smoking coal. Yeah, it used to be a blue flame, a bloody smoke come off. And then all day I'm this in the corner of the mouth. Oh Christ, I couldn't stand the taste of it. And, and you just think, these guys were giants, you know, you think, how can you, do? Christ, they're just so tough, but they never showed anything. But they didn't fit into towns, you know. I suppose they'd come home from the war if they'd been out, and a lot of them would have been in those days. Um, just had a gut full of noise and civilization and wanted a bit of peace. Because there's no doubt about it. It was hard graft, but it was very peaceful, you know, very peaceful. If I hadn't learned from them guys, God, oh man, could have still been a bloody idiot bumbling around town. And I've never forgot a lot of them either. They were very tolerant and had a hell of a lot of patience because I think they knew if they were going to teach you to do something, this is the way you do it. His kids always say to me, when you're going on your next adventure, and that's exactly what it is. You're not a kid anymore, but it's still an adventure because you haven't a bloody clue when you're going to run it out there. You know, you don't. It's always the unexpected. Now you'd be belting along the road, and next minute, a bloody gay goanna will come out in front, and some of them things are three foot, six, four foot long. And you just think, oh, Jesus, I was lucky to see that out here. I try to get up first light because you've got your sides up in your cab, and it's beautiful in this country in the morning. It's chilly, actually, quite often it's chilly. Go out and do a couple of hours prospecting.
It looks easy, but if the heat gets you, the flies give you the shits. It's pretty hard on you. You can only do a few hours and you've got to stop. Go and have a cup of coffee. Go and read a book. Go and cook a feed or do something because your ears start to lose their acuteness and, you, and you're starting to get a bit sloppy. Women made the best detectives because they're so bloody obstinate, resilient or something. But they're, and they're a lot carefuler. They go slower and they actually cover the ground. It sounds strange, I know, but it's, um, sometimes I think it's just an excuse for me to get out there and waddle around the scrub and have a reason for being there. Oh, right. Better than I, I'm quite happy to come home sometimes and not have a piece of gold in my pocket. I don't get my detector out sometimes. I just think, oh shit, this is interesting. So I might spend the day just roaming around, just enjoying the environment. This is so much to see in this country. Just, you can be in the middle of nowhere and you think, well, no one's ever been here and bugger me dead if you don't turn around and here's a couple of gravestones. See, over here, when you chop a heap of trees down, you put up a hut or a house or a pub or something that they had with the numerous towns through the gold fields. Nothing grows up quick around here like it in New Zealand. You can go to a site that's been there for 130 years and it's... Um, it's not much disrepair than it was 30 years after they left it. It just, your timber rots away, but everything else sits there. And because of the winds in this county, shifting the sands, it's amazing what you pick up, like nails, uh, copper rivets, bloody Levi buttons. They must have used millions of them in this country. They used to get all the old tins and melt them and collect the solder. So when they made things, they could use that solder, you know, to re-solder metal and tins. Yeah, everything had a purpose. People often say to me, oh, aren't you scared out there at night? The dingoes might get you or something. Or you might get bitten by a snake. No, it's not. But if you ask me if I'd walk through the bloody, um, the nightclub area in Perth at two o'clock in the morning and not be nervous, that, that'll be the frosty Friday. I waddle around no shoes and boots on, I don't know if it's night time and it could be, you just accept what's there. When I go north and I start pushing the boundaries a bit and going where probably you know, a lot of people say, well, you shouldn't go out there and you own. And I agree, I mean, you stuff up out there, you're in a bit of strife. They say, well, you should take an EPIRB and all this sort of shit. And, and I stand up and say, the day I need an EPIRB out there, I shouldn't be out there. I mean, you're always going to get in the shit anyway. You know, it's no doubt about that. If, it's like the old story, if you've never got lost, you've never been anywhere. You're just doing it and you're enjoying it and you don't clutter your mind up with reasons why. You're not running away from anything, you're going to something. There's another hill up there and I've got to get over the top of that one just to see what's there, so you can go over the next one. Just got to keep looking. I haven't found what I'm looking for yet. It's been a few years. I have sometimes wondered about what life would be like if Mum and Boomer had stuck together and how it's different because uh, I grew up with Merv and Mum. And I've always thought my life was probably better the way it turned out because from the sounds of it I could be living in the back of beyond in Australia or having grown up some 
gold miner's daughter or something, rather than someone who was quite successful. I'd known Candace growing up. She was a pretty lively kid, similar age to my own kids. We knew she was going to Western Australia about the same time we were going to catch up with their best friend Lorna. Their daughters were best friends too. So we timed our trips to coincide, suggested she drive out and meet her biological father for the first time. Candace was up for it. I feel okay. I feel, I don't know, I'm quite happy to be out here having a look at the kind of place that he must live in and you can't help but wonder why anyone would want to live here. Um, but no, I feel, I feel okay about it. I guess one of the reasons I never asked too many questions was that I didn't want to upset anything. If everyone was happy not talking about it, I was happy not talking about it as well. They used to share in the pub now and again, she'd be waddling around as a kid. I don't really feel like I need to have a relationship with him. It's a one-time opportunity that I'm taking, really. I remember one day she was just standing there looking at me. I said, yes, yeah, I know you are. Hopefully it's not all question, answer, question, answer. You know, there's just some cat things that spontaneously come up you know, that we can enjoy. Well, just take it as it goes. I mean, I don't know. She might want to fucking hit me over the head with a log. I don't know. I'll find it for her. No, you won't. <laughs> I'll get your chainsaw out. No, you won't. <laughs> You're supposed to be on my side. I am, darling. It feels like there should be certain questions that need to be asked and certain answers maybe that need to be answered. And I'm worried about the awkwardness of that. What can you say? G'day, remember me? I ran out on you when you were little. Johnny Cash is the same. <laughs> yes. I think Mum is more worried that maybe I have expectations. Uh, and she said, um, you know, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. He never put any effort into you. Um, and having a daughter, I know what it's like to raise a child. And there are some pretty crappy dads out there that don't really do much work or put any effort in. It's just part of life, we do these things. I mean, he is who he is and he did what he did and there's a thousand other people out there just like that. But her bloke died, didn't he? Jesus, that was a bit rough. How old was he? He can't be very old. I think one positive thing that's come out of me not knowing Boomer growing up was that when my partner and my daughter's father passed away recently, I was worried and scared for her to be without her dad. But I've been able to realise that I grew up without my biological dad and I still had a happy life. So it makes me think that, you know, she can still have a good life, um, even if she doesn't have him around. Oh, I knew you'd say that. You do? Honey, taller. Oh. How are you, Sweeney? Good to see a bit of colour in the family. <laughs> <laughs> He's white -ish. You guys want another ginger beer? Yeah. Okay, do you want some ice? I guess. Hope them kids aren't frightened of chooks. <laughs> some hundreds of them don't go home without any eggs, do they? <laughs> like a few dozen. <laughs> oh, really? God, how many are there? Chooks. Yeah. We've never counted. Thank you. Oh, wow. What do you say? Thank you. Yeah? Thank you. Mm. Get into it. You're allowed out of the sun. Yeah. Bring a vent. Oh, we can do it over there. So, where did you grow up? Westport. Oh, okay. Right. And they sent me to St. Kevin's College in Omaru. That was a culture shock. Omaru. Yeah. What for? Twelve years age. Boarding school. Never forgiven him. <laughs> I was in form four, I think, when I finally decided this isn't for me. 
and just went into, um, I think it was Del Geddes. Said, so you got any jobs and farms in the back country? I said, yeah. I said, I'll have one. <laughs> Knew nothing about farming. <laughs> but it was good because all the blokes I worked with were all in their 40s probably then, and all the old school bushmen. Yeah. They were, yeah, they were good. Everything was done on foot or horses. And uh, yeah, it was good. Yeah. Obviously, like the outdoors. We've never sort of celebrated birthdays or anything. No, there's no animosity amongst us all, but we just, we're no different than the other family. I'm a bit strange that way, people to people. Yeah. I, I never think that any kid of mine was any more special than any other kid. Yeah. Yeah. So do you live in Auckland itself? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you know Auckland very well. No. But... We've come over a couple of times, I think. Um... Well, Christ, you know where we are. Don't ever be shy. Just pop up. <laughs> it's quite far to come. It but is. I'll come over here again. We're getting the right ones, I hope. Mm. You never know, though. Could be filming out here. Well, the company I'm working for at the moment make Kalgoorlie cops, so. Oh, do they? Could end up there. <laughs> what a rubber dick show that is. <laughs> Most TV shows, are. Eh? Yeah. That, so that would be, I guess, my grandmother, and that's Boomer, and he does look pretty brown. I was always black as a child. Is this just his mates, is that? Yeah. And their All wives and girlfriends. Were they married? Are they reading on screen? Ellington. Yeah, well, that's 43. You know, I would have been married because I was born in 44. Colin. This is Ben. Bissonetti. Yeah. Oh, so your mum married a daily after? Yeah. Oh. I was about seven when she got married. Bissonetti? Mm. That's not a Mexican name. No, it's not. It's like Italian or something. It came from Queen. Yes. Your mum lived on the west coast or she moved down from... Yeah. Ooh, there's your great-great-grandmother. She's Mexican. Now, do you like to mess with her? Well, would it? <laughs> <laughs> she is smiling. Is she? Yes. You know, I've never noticed that. She is too. Italian, Mexican. Working in Canada, you know, when you think about how hard it would have been to get around in those days. So there you go. Oh, that's cool. Life history, just flash for your eyes. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. <laughs> that's the dredge, is it? That's the old dredge the boys had years ago, yep. That's a slate. Was it? Yeah, that's where I had my dredging gear. That's a blue duck, is it? Yep. There's is actually it? still a bit of gold in that country. Mm. When that daughter of yours grows up and I'm not dead yet, I might just tell her where it is. <laughs> I reckon it was about seven to nine ounces there, I estimate, minimum, that I left there. What, you just, what do you mean left there? And, just packed up and went. Oh. Yeah. So you're vacuum cleaning all the finer exactly. stuff. Exactly, it's exactly, and right. you're using water. And the last thing to go up is your gold. These are yeah. some of the bigger nuggets, are they? Yeah. They live in a family group, these lizards. Mm. And they hunt at night time. Funny. But they stay in family units. Yeah. And uh, would you get them lizards out if you go in their deer place? And they've got these amazing teeth. It's like looking at a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. They were just so different. Anyway, I came home and I was reading the farm magazine. Rare find! The second lot of these lizards had been found in WA. And I said, well, they're not rare. I've got about five of them in my freezer out of <laughs> To our land care lady. Oh. Aren't they amazing? Oh, she's beautiful. I was working for a cocky at the time and I shifted them because I didn't want them to be destroyed. Yeah. I might as well just killed them immediately. It was a bloody shame. How Poppy long did they live? Did they go all right for a while or? I had a piece of glass sitting there just to, so they have a bit of daylight and get a bit of warmth. Yeah. But when she had a look at them, she put the glass right over it oh. and it was a, a 20 litre plastic container. They cooked. I wasn't impressed. It sounds like you spend a lot of time out there. Oh, I do. The... Oh, shit, yeah. yeah. I'd spend half a year or more out there. You just like finding it. See, this is different. You feel the weight of that. Yeah, it's a lot heavier. Yeah, because it's it's that's come off a reef at some stage. Six and a half grams worth. But it's light, eh? Yeah, I was going to say that. You feel that? Stick your hand through there. Yeah. That's it. 
walking like that all day. Yep. All, and the, do you do it in the mornings and the evenings when yep. it's less hot? Yep. Just doing it all the day. I don't know. I don't think I could live in Australia. There's too many bugs and things. Spiders. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like spiders? Yeah. Well, look out, you're in the wild. You've got a brown yeah. tree. Oh, oh, it's too contrasty. I can't get the cool brick. What is these? It looks like potatoes or something. Yeah. I think it's you. Chili peppers. Oh, chilies. Chili peppers. Yep. A couple of years ago, it went real bad, and they still insist in planting it. All that brown you see there, it's just been burnt off from salt. It just burns the crop. Why wouldn't you plant it in trees? They planted a bit of it down there in trees. A lot of farmers aren't real good land management, so just no. take the money and run, Charlie. Yeah. Yeah. Hopeless. Well, I'm going to have to get Bronny's camera out. Bron, we'll have to get your camera out and get a photo of the mob. Yeah, yeah we will. Okay, look at it now. Look at that lady's funny camera. Oh, I've got a good camera. I've okay. walked out of court and had many cameras <laughs> No, you never walked out of court. You usually got seen away, didn't you? One more here. Okay. Oh, you take care, oh, young lady. Nice yeah, nice to meet you. Lovely to meet you. We <laughs> <laughs> might see you again one day, you never know. Yeah, God, who knows where I'll end up. True. You probably won't end up over there, though, will you? I don't know. Um, Someone I... drops dead, maybe? I'll uh, waddle over there, I suppose, for a day, but I'd probably want to go out and live up in the bloody bay where I was, but I don't know if the law's allowed out now in these parks and things, okay. you see. You can't, and the fun police here are getting worse and worse. Yeah. You take care, young lady. Layla. Yes, baby. Take care. Bye, bye, sweetie. You take care too. Hopefully next time you get some kids. Get your uh, windows down to get the flies out. Go, we'll let all the flies out or in yeah. or something. Yeah. Passes eggs. Um, just turn around there, I suppose. Is There's probably enough room, even you for take a woman, care. eh? Yeah, ha, ha, don't even start that. I think she's, I think she's got some bad father to have I think she does a bit of a father there. Gotcha! <laughs> Travel carefully! It's good. It's excellent. A bit strange. I mean, you don't do that sort of shit every day, do you? No, it's good. I think everyone handled it all right. Yeah. I guess I'm feeling glad that I've done that um, and it was cool to see him. He didn't look as old as I thought he would. I actually had quite an old man in my head, but no, it was, it was good. She wants to come back any time. She's uh, quite welcome. Quite light-hearted and although it was qu quite hard to get any answers or get an opportunity to ask any deep kind of questions about anything um, because he does love to talk. Lovely day. It was, it was. Just pretty, it's a bit short. I mean, there's, you just you just can't fit everything in, eh? I think if I had had higher hopes of him being interested in me, that would have been quite disappointing. But, but I didn't really, you know. I wondered whether he'd want to hear my life story, um, so I kind of thought about what I'd say, but, you know, it didn't need to be said, really. Maybe he... It was interesting that he said he's always felt that his children were not more special than anybody else's kids, um, quite early on. No, she's, too, she's a very bloody uh, sort of together woman, actually. She's just, yeah, she would be proud of herself. Something that's come out of it, I guess, is I don't have a biological father I've never met anymore. I'll never say, oh, I never met my biological father again. I'll say, Oh, you know, I found my biological father once and went and said hello in the middle of nowhere. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I'd found the man, still living by Boomer's law, got a glimpse of the person inside. That was enough. <laughs> <laughs>